All right. Good evening, everybody. We had a little bit of a technical delay here, um, but we're back. We're ready to rock and roll. Uh, my name is Steve Grumbine. I'm the founder of Real Progressives. And tonight we have a special, special show. One of the originators, one of the original uh, creators, if you will, the identifiers, the researchers of modern monetary theory, Dr. Bill Mitchell will be joining us tonight. Um, extremely exciting for me. Um, having been able to talk with people like Warren Mosler, Stephanie Kelton, Pavlina Cherneva, Randy Ray, et cetera. Dr. Bill seemed to be one of the people that I had no hope and prayer in being able to reach. And I am so, so ecstatic about being able to bring him on. So without further ado, let me bring on Dr. Bill Mitchell. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Tell me, you know, for me, once the light bulbs have gone off for me, um, I haven't been able to shut it down. It's It's been consuming to me to know how much suffering goes on in the world unnecessarily and how much of it is based on myths and legends and, and things of yesteryear that maybe were, uh, you know, valid, et cetera. But you are one of the original pioneers. Um, can you talk a little bit about how modern monetary theory came to be a school of thought? Well, it's a long story. I mean, the, the, the original people involved obviously came from different backgrounds. Uh, Warren came from a commercial, Warren Mosler came from a commercial background in finance. And uh, Randy and myself and then Stephanie came from an academic background. And there were various academic threads that the, the academic side of the project had obviously been exposed to for many years. And uh, we go back, you know, to, well, for me, I go back to Marx and Kleski. I go back to... Uh, uh, Abba Lerner and, you know, Randy and Stephanie similarly. And uh, Warren was doing his thing in the financial markets. And um, I think around 1994, uh, there was, it was in the early days of the internet and uh, the old email discussion lists were the, the tenor of the period where uh, you could actually, for the first time, communicate very quickly with people all around the world. And for for an Australian such as myself, the internet was a liberating feature. We, and, and that's one of the reasons why I always tell progressives, don't rail against globalisation because uh, it's a progressive force uh, if it's used properly. But uh, these, this email discussion list brought... Warren and uh, Randy and myself and others together, obviously, uh, uh, in a in a relatively you know unplanned fashion, we just uh, were interested in the uh, heterodox post Keynesian economics, uh, which has sort of been our background, and um, it seemed it seemed like there were all these missing parts to me and. Uh, I remember one day I got a phone call and um, I was at home. It was a weekend and uh, I live on the east coast of Australia, north, just north of Sydney. And um, it was Warren Mosler on the phone. And he said, this, this American accent came over and said, oh, I'm Warren Mosler, I'm in Sydney, I'm going to come up and see you. And Warren had been interested in things that I was adding to this discussion list and... Uh, uh, so we met and uh, it became clear to me there was a, the, the missing link to me because in, 19, about 19, in 1978 I did my fourth year at university and in that year I developed a, a, the idea of a buffer stock full employment approach which is now central to modern monetary theory and uh, I, I developed that idea out of my studies in agricultural economics where the Australian government used to buy up all the... It wanted to guarantee a fixed income to farmers, a guaranteed income, because the rural lobby was very powerful. 
And so it, it, the Australian government would buy up excess wool in the wool markets each year, store it, and uh, guarantee the price. And of course, when the, if there was a too much, uh, uh, too little wool at one year, they would sell that wool back into the market again. And so we we're all around Australia, there were these big brick buildings full of wool. And they were government buildings and they were government holdings of wool, which guaranteed full employment of wool, stabilised the market. And uh, I wasn't too much interested in wool, but I, I saw it at the time, uh, it was late 70s, as I said, and uh, unemployment was, mass unemployment was starting to rise. It was the beginning of the neoliberal era. And at, at that point, I decided that this wool price stabilisation scheme could become a full employment scheme a job guarantee scheme, if you like, in the way we talk about it now. So I had those ideas and the, the missing link that Warren provided to me was his knowledge, his commercial knowledge of the inner workings of commercial banking and the interaction between commercial banks and central banks because a mainstream economics background really neglects all of those things. And so it went from there, really. We had... we we. There were about five of us and uh, we teamed up and uh, started talking about a, pro a project. <coughs> there was a, a conference in New York in 1996 which brought us all together physically for the first time. And then it went from there, basically. Uh, we started to uh, uh, talk about how we were going to promote this idea, write about it. And I remember... I was visiting the US in about 2004, two, yeah, 2004, and I said to the the, the, the team who was sitting around a, uh, a table drinking cups of tea, I think, I can't remember, but it was something like that. But uh, I said to them, I'm starting a blog. And I remember Randy just looked at me as if I was from outer space. Yeah. And, uh, he said, uh, I said, look, we've been going at this now for maybe 10 years and we've been writing a lot of academic stuff and uh, putting out uh, uh, material. We've had some websites up and running, but we weren't really cutting through very much. And uh, so I decided I'd start a blog. And, from, and initially Randy and uh, Warren didn't have any interest in that. But they soon did because that was our path into mainstream, into into the public, if you like, who 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 weren't weren't going to read our journal articles and our academic books, but they could re they the medium of the blog and you know your type of uh, formats were the way in which we could bring quite at times abstract academic academic ideas which have a lot behind them, uh, both historically but also conceptually, we could bring them into the public domain and uh, uh, parcel them up in... The, the blog is a little parcel each day. And uh, uh, so that's where that's where it's gone. And now I think we've uh, gone from... Warren used to joke <laughs> when we'd meet up that he could count the MMTs on one hand because uh, there are only a few of us. And now I would say there would be millions of MMTs around the world. I, I would like to agree with you. Um, I want to also state for the record that your particular blog post about taxpayers don't fund anything is, is such an important piece for those of us who are foot soldiers in this battle. And it is a battle, make no mistake about it. And it's a wall. Um, we are accosted daily by people that call us MMT cultists. We are accosted daily by people that tell us that we are apologists for the evil banking cartel. We are called all sorts of horrible names because well, see, of Rothschild and all the other nonsense. And they say that we get money creation all wrong. So that brings me to the next point. Just on that point, think about like when I first started out on this stuff, because uh, I come from not a Keynesian background, but more a Marxist background. And uh, I used to get a, 
get absolutely abused by the hardcore Marxists for being a, an apologist for capitalism because I wanted a full employment scheme to ease the, in, you know, the suffering of the unemployed, but apparently that was propping up capitalism. And I used to say to the people, these were all academics who had secure incomes, good, good, good incomes, probably paying off a nice house in Sydney or somewhere else around the world. And uh, um, I used to say to them, well, look, you know, you can uh, plot and scheme your revolutions while you're having your cup of coffee and your croissant on a Saturday morning, you know, but I'd prefer to get jobs out there for people now, even if that props up capitalism for a little while. So there you go. No, it, it's incredible. Now, uh, Dr. Mitchell, if, if you do me a small favor, I'm echoing because of the speakers. Is there any way you could turn the volume down just a teeny bit on your computer momentarily? How's that? That's much better. All right. So let me ask you this next question. This is, this is maybe the most important thing that we're facing right now next to, obviously, the same pressures you were getting for the hardcore Marxists. Yeah. We are getting battered and bashed by folks that don't understand money creation, central banking, et cetera. They conflate the IOUs of banks, the bank money, if you will, with sovereign money that is created in a net financial asset driven uh, way. They're confusing the, the zeroing out of bank loans versus net financial asset creation. Can you please break down the money creation process so that people have a better understanding of the difference? Maybe even talk a little bit about the hierarchy of money so they understand that money and currency and all these different things are, are different terms. Can you take a crack at that? Uh, well, we'll see. <laughs> I, I mean, the, the, the commercial banks under, under in the advanced world and everywhere, really, they do create money. Uh, and so for those MMTs, and I call them the sort of internet MMTs, which isn't a put down, but they're the sort of second generation. They're the, they're the foot soldiers, to use your terminology. They sometimes say, oh, yeah, but MMT thinks that the banks don't create money. And, uh, and when they find out that we say that the commercial banks can create money, they, some of the ones who are, have a peripheral commitment start worrying about this uh, the point you made earlier that, oh, we're just apologists for the banking sector because, of course, I'm on the record for a long period of time as uh, as being an antagonist to this movement called positive money, which wants to eliminate uh, the commercial bank's ability to basically c create deposits out of loans. Uh, but the banks do create money, but the point that you're, you're, you're trying to tease out is a different one. And that's why MMTs tend not to talk about money, they talk about net financial assets. Now, when the banks create a, a loan, they immediately, loans create a deposit, and that creates a stream of liquidity that can be drawn by the uh, possessor of the loan, the person who's gone into debt, to buy whatever they like. So in that sense, uh, the commercial banks, through their their lending capacity and their, their deposit creation capacity, can create liquidity, purchasing power. There's no doubt about that. That's fine. And we want them to do that uh, because that's a, that's a convenience for all of us if it's properly regulated and uh, it doesn't go out of control. But the point about it is that the when the bank's creating that liability, or, or think about it another way, when the bank's creating its loan, which for us, for it is an asset, and for us is a liability, those two things in financial terms net out to zero. In other words, there's an equal asset created for the liability that's created. So there's nothing net created. There's a a stream of purchasing power created 
but it's not a net addition to financial wealth. And moreover, the bank, who clearly has the capacity to do that under our under the sort of normal operations of our financial system, they also have to cover that deposit in one way or another by adding to reserves. Because when you say you or I have a loan, when we start spending the de the deposit funds that have been created under that loan, and let's say we uh, we we spend it on something that uh, uh, the stream of uh, flow of income goes to an, a person who banks in a different bank, and they put that money in that that stream of funds in their bank. Well, then at the end of the day, the there's going to be a call on the originating bank for the the funds, and that's all mediated through the payment system, through the reserves that the commercial banks keep at the central bank. So you, the, the, the loan originator has to get the funds from somewhere to honour the deposits, otherwise, you know, the check bounces, as to use the parlance. And so there's a whole variety of ways in which the banks can get those reserves. They can get them in wholesale funding markets, they can get them from attracting deposits or they can get them from their other banking competitors at a, at a particular rate depending upon and where they'll access those funds from depends upon the, uh, the, the, the cost benefit, the profitability of, of different sources of funding the reserves. So the banks can, can create money via loan creation but they, they don't get the, they've got to ultimately cover those and there's nothing net created. Whereas when a government spends, it's spending without having the necessity in principle, and I'm, I'm abstracting from institutional arrangements that might be voluntarily put in place, you know, accounting arrangements where government spends from a particular bank, uh, you know, particular account or something. But but in conceptual terms, a, a, a currency issuing government can spend without limit, really, uh, up to infinity, uh, uh, without having a prior source of funds. And when it does that, it creates something net in the non-government sector it creates net wealth increment in the non-government sector in the same way that when it withdraws funds from the non-government sector via taxation, it destroys net non-government sector wealth. And that's unique to the currency issuer and it's quite a different process to the way in which commercial banks create purchasing power through the loan deposit process. How's that? That was fantastic, sir. That was absolutely beautiful. And what, what I'm trying, I guess you, you picked up on where I was trying to head with this. You know, if I go to my local grocery store and they provide me with a coupon or I want to send an envelope uh, with a love letter to my wife, um, and I put a stamp on it, these are forms of money, correct? I mean, this, this is where... I, I think the idea here is is that the, the idea of money, um, money takes many, many forms. Um, and, and the idea that banks create money is, is not really saying, in my opinion, it's not saying as much as saying that it can create net financial assets. In other words, it can pr build wealth because ultimately at the end of the day, you've got to pay that money back. It go, you know, they keep their interest or whatever. That's how they gain their money. That's how they gain their wealth, if you will. But the idea here is, is that when our federal government spends, it can actually increase that, whereas the banks have to zero it out. Am I close to correct there? Yeah, I'm not sure I would call a stamp money, but uh, in the same way that I'd call a deposit created by a loan money. But these are nuances. The, the essential point is that when the 
currency issuing government spends or taxes, it creates or destroys, respectively, something net in the non-government sector. And so the extension of that is that typically we hear a mainstream economist talking about how the virtues of fiscal surpluses where governments spend less than they tax as if that's a virtue that we should aspire to, whereas the way an MMT looks at that is that a fiscal surplus is a destruction of non-government sector, that's us, our net wealth. And from my perspective, when uh, I lose wealth, that's a bad thing, not a good thing. And I, so it, it's sort of ridiculous to, to aspire to surpluses as a virtuous thing be, because it's actually destroying non-government sector wealth. Whereas when the government calls in a loan, uh, sorry, when a commercial bank calls in a loan through regular payments, that's, that income stream is just writing off a previously created liability. Uh, it's, it's nothing net is happening. Understood. Okay. So, all right. So let me, let me ask you the next question here. We, we are facing a, a time where people are not only skeptical of our government, skeptical of world government, skeptical of the banking powers around the world, et cetera. Very wealthy people have always existed in, in the world, um, but they're very, very skeptical. And they've got a large number of conspiracies that, for example, the positive money people, the AMI crowd here in the States, uh, talk specifically about this concept of national reserve banking, which um, Warren um, stated ended in 1934, something to that effect. Um, can, can you talk about the fractional reserve system that uh, people like Ron Paul and Dennis Kucinich and this NEED Act seek to uh, terminate um, and, and whether or not it really exists and, and what actually does exist, if, if anything does exist in that regard? Well, I mean, the way, the way the, a student of economics who goes into a mainstream undergraduate program and it gets worse at postgraduate level, comes out of there, out of that program, more ignorant than they went in. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a economic, mainstream economic programs really shouldn't be called education. They're miseducation. And a student who otherwise is quite intelligent with good common sense ends up a, a, a jargon ridden, ridden, babbling wreck whose conception of the banking sector, for example, in this context, is just totally wrong. What they learn is that here we've got these institutions we call the banks, and they put up a sign and uh, they, they uh, put up a sign calling for deposits. And uh, they offer some sort of uh, inducement in a form of a, a, an interest payment for people to deposit money, you know, funds in their institution. And when they get those funds, they then can lend them out. This is the mainstream story. And the institutional arrangements govern, governing banking may require for prudential purposes, now this is not me talking, I'm just giving the mainstream story, sure. may require for prudential purposes that the banks retain 10% of their 10% say of their deposit base in in reserves that can't be lent out. So the other 90% can be lent out. And so they they lend them out and uh, they can get they then get more deposits coming in and they lend them out. And so you get this multiplying every time they get a dollar of deposits, they can lend out 90 cents. They've got to keep 10 cents because of these 
fractional reserve requirements. And uh, whereas in Australia, by the way, we have no fractional reserve, no reserve requirements, but you do in the US. And so you get this multiplied effect in the money supply. This is the explanation for the way the banks create money. It's a, it's a multiplying uh, effect based upon the facts that they can start off with a small deposit base and then just keep multiplying that out through succession of loans in, in, uh, uh, out to other clients. And so we get this, argue, this idea that uh, banks need reserves before they can lend, in other words, deposits in this context. And uh, so the real, the positive money crowd, and as you say in America, the AMI, the, these characters, and the politicians that have seized on this, have this idea that, well, we don't want the banks, the source of financial instability is the bank's ability to lend and multiply these deposits out into the money supply. And uh, so the way to control that is to uh, deny them the ability to create this escalating or multiplying effect. And in other words, force them to only lend what they've already got in their vaults in the form of deposits. So in the real world, the the deposit base of the banks is much less than the overall amount of money flowing around because of this multiplication. But the positive money people and those who want to place restrictions on this say that the the source of the problem is this fractional rule that banks don't have to hold all of their loan book in deposits. And so their solution is to ensure like an old post giro system that the institution always has at any point in time the funds that are out in their vaults that are also on loan. Now, from an MMT point of view, that's completely the reverse of the way the system operates because the, in the real world, the a bank lending officer will never type in to a computer or make a phone call or look up a book to find out whether they've got reserves in which they can lend. The bank lending officer is on a, some sort of inducement to get as many le loans out as possible and they're lending like fury to any credit worthy customer and the idea of a credit worthy customer varies depending upon the risk environment in the economy at a time. So just before the GFC really manifested, the idea of a credit worthy customer was someone with no income, <laughs> no assets or whatever, but, and then it tightens up when there's a crisis. But the, the loan officer in the bank is just lending and creating deposits wherever and then another division of the bank has to rush around and work out whether they can cover all of their calls each day on the payment system. And that's what, you know, they're the reserve managers, but it's the reserves coming after the effect rather than before the effect that describes the way in which the banking system operates. And that's a, f a fundamental distinction between MMT and mainstream economics. And as I've said in the past, it's a fundamental contribution of MMT. So you get a lot of these uh, so-called new Keynesians and whatever uh, saying, well, MMT is nothing new in MMT. Well, yes, there is. There's fundamentally different things. We don't believe in a money multiplier. That's, that's great. So Randall Ray wrote a paper some time ago you know, say banks don't lend reserves. Who knew MMT? That's who. And it breaks down how all the textbooks of yesteryear completely led us all down the wrong path to begin with. So to some degree, there's, you know, what can you do? You went to college, they taught you this stuff and you left out dumber than you were going in. Um, this, this brings me to the next point, And that is that, you know, Bernie Sanders um, you know, who had the luxury of working with uh, Dr. Kelton and uh, 
a host of other people. I believe Randy Ray helped out and James Galbraith and, and some others that Bill Black, et cetera, that are um, definitely, uh, you know, in the MMT community. Um, and, and he proposed a radical agenda for America because we're very right wing here, even though we believe we <laughs> we've got some left wing in us. Um, you know, he proposed a New Deal America, basically. And, uh, you know, a, like FDR's second bill of rights kind of New Deal America. And, and the recurring theme over and over again was how are you going to pay for it? Jill Stein of the Green Party came out with the Green New Deal. And she is a chief proponent, unfortunately, at this time of the uh, AMI platform, which we're hoping over the next couple of days, I'll be able to start talking with them and, and build some inroads with the Green Party to change their uh, stance and adopt MMT as their official platform. Um, but ultimately, the Green New Deal, Bernie Sanders New Deal, that whole ball, if you will, of programs is an incredibly large amount of money that would need to be spent. So you had Hillary Clinton demeaning anybody that supported this, saying, oh, you're little children, you're basement dwellers. Trust me, it's a lot more difficult than that. How are you going to pay for this? And, you know, all the other people from yesteryear who spent so much time trying to make sure we knew we couldn't afford it. Can you talk a little bit about how we as progressives – and leverage the knowledge of modern monetary theory to get out the word that we can afford radical change from a federal job guarantee to Medicare for all to student de debt relief, et cetera. I mean, it, it, people really are squashed into believing that they're only worthy of crumbs. And, and we've spent seven days a week for the last couple of years just pounding and pounding and pounding on the idea that we have a vast amount of policy space that we can enact a very, very robust progressive agenda. Can you talk a little bit about that, Dr. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask because I've been spending several decades uh, without all that much success, although we're getting, getting some traction these days. Uh, you know, it reminds me of when when we I first started advocating large scale public sector job creation programs, which of course in the you know thirties and the forties and fifties, nobody nobody blinked an eye at about they they knew that the government could do this and uh, they you know, but I, I used to get uh, I used to get affronted with this idea that well where where are the jobs going to come from. And I used to say to them that, you know, I've forgotten the date. Is it 68 when you when the first moon landing or 69? Whatever. I think it was 69. Whatever. I said if in 1968, let's say, or 69, uh, humanity can accomplish the physics and the geography and the mechanical engineering feats, we were smart enough to get a little bit of metal and take it up to the moon and land it and walk around and stuff, then why are you so unsure we can't create a few jobs? And it just seemed to be that we have this uh, selective intelligence and uh, it's no surprise because uh, the what I call the elites or in Australian parlance the top end of town uh, they've got a they've got an incentive to to keep us dumb on these things and to obfuscate and to uh, make it look harder than what it is. I remember I was uh, doing some work in South Africa on the expanded public works program, which uh, has created millions of guaranteed jobs to people, and almost everybody who participated in that in those public work schemes moved across the international poverty line. And there were various officials there, an IMF official, uh, various uh, conservative American educated treasury officials from South Africa. And, um, you know, one of them said, well, this is, you know, solving the unemployment problem in South Africa is an incredibly complex problem. And when you 
when you interact with these international agencies, you get used to the introductory spiels where the conservatives come out and talk about complexity, you know, and uh, difficulty and, and multi, multi-level. That's another one of the terms they use. Multi-level complexity. And I remember at that particular meeting, I just said, look, there's nothing complex about creating a job. We can, we can get out there and create stacks of jobs, no problem. And uh, so there's this incentive uh, and a self 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 uh, in self um, reinforcing motivation to keep us all dumb. And uh, how how we break through that? Uh, because most of the propositions that we talk about ultimately are pretty easy to understand. Uh, that it's 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 not rocket science to know that if. Uh, uh, if I can get people to accept uh, some tokens with my image on them and uh, pay me back in taxes and I can get them to do jobs for those tokens, then I can spend, uh, un- I can issue unlimited quantities of them. And it's not a, you know, no one blinked an eyelid when your uh, central bank governor, Ben Bernanke, at the height of the crisis spent, you know, trillions of made trillions of US dollars available. No one blinked an eyelid until, of course, the uh, top end of town, the uh, Wall Street banksters, uh, had their salaries and institutions safe, and then they started to carry on about, well, where's the money coming from? Well, you know, these ideas aren't very difficult, but getting them through the group think, I call it, the conservative... Uh, uh, wall of uh, deceit and uh, ignorance is very hard and uh, I don't know how you do it except I thought that the way I would do it was through blogging and uh, one of the things that I that I've that I committed to was to maintain consistency in blogging because one of the uh, one of the problems of uh, blogs as they come in and out of uh, uh, currency. So I decided that the only way I could do it would be to blog most days, just write a few notes, uh, and, and that that's my commitment. Uh, and now what you're doing is picking up on that effort, thank you, and uh, uh, building, building a, a sort of an, another layer of resistance. And... I remember when when we first got this project going, uh, and this is no put down, it's an observation that the Americans on the project, and we know who they are because there weren't very many of us, they were very optimistic that this wouldn't take very long. And uh, I'm, I'm a, Australians are much more cautious, I think. And I, I figured and that it would take a long time and uh, that it would be beyond beyond my era where these ideas would become currency and uh, what what we needed to do as the early MMTers was build a base of knowledge for posterity, get as many young PhD students educated in MMT and out there into colleges and other academic positions and infiltrating the bureaucracy in you know our state your state departments, our Commonwealth departments and eventually, as more and more crises emerged, uh, as the evidence base built, uh, supporting the things that we uh, talk about, then there would be a paradigm shift. Because one of the things that I that gives me optimism is that I've lived through one major paradigm shift in economics, and that was the shift from Keynesian thinking to monetarist thinking in in the early 70s, which then has morphed into this neoliberal infestation. And uh, so I've lived through a major paradigm shift in economics and I'm hoping I can live through another one uh, and I'm hoping you do and I'm hoping we get there sooner rather than later. But but I think it's a, these idea shifts take a long time. And... Uh, can, can, uh, can we- Go on. Sorry.
No, no, no. I, I, I believe me when I say this, your your words are far more important. I wanted to just raise one issue that has been um, critical to me as I try to explain to folks, because we have so many people in our movement that claim to want to fight neoliberalism and they really can't even define neoliberalism. They don't understand the cause and effect of neo neoliberalism. They don't understand monetarism. They don't understand the effect of Milton Friedman. And quite frankly, they don't understand the financialization of our economy as the public spending, the public space has been basically done away with in favor of allowing us to take on that debt burden as private citizens to uh, survive with our rugged individualism versus allowing the federal government to do its job and keep the bathtub full. Um, can you talk a little bit about why wealth inequality and income inequality has grown so much? I have been on the record repeatedly saying that because in the 70s, they basically cut away space for spending on the people. What you had was our debts during our downtime became the wealthy people's basic income, basically, as we've had to take on private debt. We've had to take on non-dischargeable student loans. We've had to take on a whole slew of things, and that money has gone up to the top as we've had to pay more and more and more for basic services because there's now interest attached, et cetera. Whereas if our federal government would have been doing its job, the wealth gap would never have gotten the way it is today. Is that true or am I off? No, no, that's that's fine. I mean, one of the when I was a, a, a younger student, one of the things we learned about in the so-called stylized facts of economic history was that in this uh, in the post-war period, and I'm talking Second World War now, the one of the stylized facts was that real wages. So the purchasing power of our incomes rose proportionately with the growth in productivity. And so workers were able to share in the, the, the economy was producing more with less input, that's productivity. And workers were able to share in that by improving incomes because ultimately this, the, the source of real income growth is productivity growth, doing more with less. We can we get we get better income growth that way. And one of that was a stylized fact that uh, workers were able to benefit from growth in productivity, and that was shared around to the benefit of all. Now that made sense also because consumption expenditure by households is the largest component of total expenditure in the economy and if you're pumping out more and more stuff per unit that's productivity growth then who's going to buy all that unless you also expand the capacity in real terms to buy that and that's our real wage uh, growth and so it made sense that for capitalism to be relatively stable uh, that the stuff that was pumping out, more and more stuff being pumped out, could be bought by those who basically buy the most of the stuff through consumption. And uh, so we had, you know, that's the, the so-called golden age of full employment. Now, that started to get interrupted by this this neoliberal period in the 70s. That That proportional relationship started to get disturbed where... The, the neoliberals wanted more of the share of income than workers. The profit wanted, to, they wanted more profits. And there was a huge discussion in the early 70s about the so-called profit squeeze. And this was uh, the building up of the elite resentment to full employment and the welfare state, however defined around the world. Different countries have different, you know, types of welfare states, but they all work to improve the lot of the worker to give job security through employment protection, to give in income growth and security, uh, to give uh, income support to those who couldn't work for various reasons, whether it be age or illness or disability. And those things were seen by the elites as squeezing profits. 
because uh, it was really the you know the, the social democratic era where where governments worked to mediate the class conflict between capital and labour and to ensure that workers were able to grow in prosperity. Now that was a you know the the the, the profit squeeze led to major dynamic coming out of America initially. Uh, and I'm thinking here of the Powell Manifesto in the early 70s. Lewis Powell was uh, ultimately became a Nixon appointment to the Supreme Court in the US. But he was uh, hired by um, capital in America, various uh, sources of money, to basically build a manifesto to fight back against this uh, profit squeeze. And he uh, outlined a vision in this Lewis, in this power manifesto, which is freely available on the internet. And I've written about it on my blog, whereby capital would defend itself and fight back against the, the social democratic movements in a number of different ways. And briefly, they were to destroy the trade unions, to infiltrate the education system, to start pumping out pro-capital ideas, uh, to infiltrate the media and create what we now would call Fox, Fox, the Fox media empire, uh, to infiltrate the Supreme Court so that key decisions in the US could be influenced by conservative forces, uh, create think tanks and fund think tanks. So you saw in America and elsewhere the rise of all these awful sort of think tanks, you know, the Peter Peterson Foundation and all of these type of well-funded propaganda organisations and that fight back led to governments relinquishing their responsibilities to defend workers' interests, trade unions around the world and definitely in Australia had less ability to fight for wage growth. And so what did you see? You saw flat wages growth start to emerge in the 80s uh, real wages skating along zero growth, if not cuts. And at the same time with all the labour market deregulation, the financial interests, the, the top end of town in Wall Street uh, petitioned the US government and, gov and governments around the world were under this same pressure to deregulate the financial sector. Now, that, that's, that was beneficial to the top end of town because by putting a break on real, in, real wage growth for workers, they created a problem for themselves because who was going to buy all the stuff was, given the ongoing productivity growth, given the fact that more and more national income was being redistributed to profits rather than workers, who was going to buy all the stuff? And so come, come in spinner, the financial deregulation meant that banks and could go crazy with credit growth and that filled the... That, that created the ability of workers to maintain their consumption spending with real flat real wages growth. And so, you know, the, the capital was on a, on a double bonus there, weren't they? They kept their sales turning over, but they also got a handy little interest payment coming back through the growth in credit. Now, that was, an, that, that was the beginnings of the growth in, in income inequality. And, of course... That was an, that that ultimately MMT as we were saying all in the early nineties that uh, that was going to come unstuck. That was an unstable, unsustainable growth path uh, because ultimately the balance sheets of the non-government sector would become so precarious uh, with all this credit growth that they they couldn't keep spending. And uh, uh, well, the, the GFC was the manifestation of that. Okay, so Dr. Mitchell, uh, being that we're about at that time, I want to ask you um, one final question, and that is you're, you're going to be coming to the United States for this uh, worldwide MMT conference in September. I believe it's the 21st through the 24th at UMKC. Can you talk a little bit about um, that, what you expect that conference to be like and, and what you're prepared to discuss? Uh, look, I think this is a fantastic 
um, initiative to basically create a forum where those interested in learning about MMT, in forming MMT networks, activist networks, grassroots networks, can come together in what won't be a typical academic conference where a lot of jargon gets exchanged but and not a lot else happens. Uh, this is going to be, in my, from my understanding, and I'm not an organiser, uh, but my understanding is that this is a, a networking event to help educate people, to help bring people together of like minds, to help uh, create strategies, uh, to take this to the next step. Uh, I notice there's a query on the page here. Yes, it will be in Kansas City at the University of Missouri. Uh, my role, I'm not sure. I mean, Stephanie initially asked me to bring my guitar because it's going to be a jam session on the Thursday night. Uh, <laughs> so I'll probably be playing a bit of guitar. But uh, uh, what we're aiming to, I'm hoping that A, we, there's a few developments. First of all, we're going to get the next phase of our next project called the MMT University up and running. And so we, we, we'll be building some governance structures and some uh, systems in place for that. And so bringing all of us together allows us to do that. Uh, the, the, M, this, the next version of the MMT textbook that uh, Randy and Martin Watson and myself have just finished, it's gone to the publisher today, finally, uh, that Macmillan will be publishing that next next year in two, in February 2018, I think, or March 2018. We'll be providing some exposition of that and giving uh, giving a workshop on on how how to go about educating yourself with MMT using this textbook within an MMT university environment. Apart from that, I'd, I'll probably be talking about a whole lot of other things. Who knows? And then I'm on my way to Britain and Europe because we're uh, myself and Thomas Farsi, my co-author uh, co on my next book, we're going to be publishing uh, the next book through Pluto Press in September 2017 and it's called Reclaiming the State. And it basically gives a historical account. You were talking before about how people don't really understand what happened when monetarism came along and the the negative legacy Milton Friedman and his gang have left us with. The first half of the book uh, talks about the historical circumstances that occurred, the, the ridiculous uh, approach of the British government in 1976 to the IMF on the ostensibly that they'd run out of money. And this is often used against MMT as to say, well, look, uh, currency issuing governments had to borrow from the MMT. Well, no, they didn't. They chose to. And then uh, Francois Mitterrand's austerity turn in 1983, a socialist government going completely the opposite direction and becoming a, a neoliberal government. Oh, but they had no choice, the Tina type mantra. Well, the book talks about all of that. And then in the second half of the book, we give what we call our, our progressive manifesto. And uh, for those who have read the uh, Communist Manifesto, it's not the choice of words that is, uh, is <laughs> deliberate. And we go through a whole series of uh, initiatives that we believe a progressive political movement should and could, could and should endorse, including a reform of the banking sector, uh, nationalisation of banks, uh, industry policies, employment policies, uh, job guarantee rather than basic income, uh, uh, environmental type strategies, uh, equity type strategies. And uh, I think that brings together all the work that I've done from an MM, through an MMT lens into an actual operational plan for a political movement. So we'll see what happens out of that. That, that is absolutely amazing. I, I am, I'm very, very excited. Dr. Mitchell, I, I want to tell you, um, first and foremost, I, I have literally been like chomping at the bit like a, like a young kid 
waiting for the opportunity to do this. When I got to speak to you the first time, it, it was amazing. And I, I'm not saying this to be fanboy here. I want you to understand the impact that you've had on my life. Ellis Whittingham, who I work with frequently, um, says that MMT is hope. And for me, this knowledge has given me a second life. I, I, I fell hard. My entire existence went kapui during the great financial crisis when, when everything went down. I lost a, a 17 year career. I was strapped with insane student debt, which I still am. But the, the idea that, oh my God, I did all this and it's over. It really is over. There's nothing to live for now. This is horrible. And it, the despair that came over me, realizing that the, the system really was rigged, so to speak. But then when I got turned on and I started learning and unlearning my MBA and all the old stuff that I had learned, so much monetarism shoved down our throats. You know, having access to you and uh, obviously Warren and Stephanie and Pavlina and Randy and, and the gang and Fidel and Ellis and Joe Firestone it's, has really, really given me a, a passion that I can't really put words to other than to just say, let my actions speak for them. <laughs> Every single day I do this because I believe it is literally the key to saving millions of lives around the world. That's um, true. Uh, you know, you know the, all of these decisions are choices that we make. And, uh, you know, I, I always say that unemployment is a choice of the government. Don't believe it comes out of, out of, a, you know, out of the mist. We make choices. And uh, I think what you're seeing around the world it, uh, the people are finally becoming really peed off about about the the lot that they're being dealt by the the system, and uh, some of that angst is uh, is going into right wing movements. But I think more I think more angst is getting fed into what I call a emergence of a true oppositional left. The mainstream left parties like your Democrat Party, the Socialist Party in France, the the uh, Labor Party in Britain, you know, under the Blairites and uh, uh, they're getting wiped they're getting wiped out. I think what uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn has demonstrated at the last election in Britain was that the uh, the, the neoliberal factions within the old Social Democratic Labor Party are, are no longer attractive. The uh, Mélenchon in France showed that there's an oppositional left outside party socialists there. And I think that what Bernie showed within the Democrat movement in America was that there can be an oppositional left that's independent of the banksters of Wall Street who sort of... Uh, uh, were supporters of Hillary Clinton. And I think that around the world progressively we'll see that emergence of a true oppositional political left and it's our role in various ways to feed that oppositional left with, with the hope and knowledge and strategy and energy to, to, to allow people to start making alternative choices. And uh, that's, I think we've, we've all got different roles to play there, but uh, you're, you're doing terrific work. Thanks very much. No, th thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell. I, I, I hate to put you on the spot, but I'm famous for it. I hope I can have you come back sometime. I hope this wasn't too painful for you. Oh, no, it's fine. It's just part of <laughs> working day, and it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell. All thank right. You. Have a good night, sir. It's the uh, middle of the day. See you later. Oh, see you later, sir. Have a good one. All, All right. right. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. This was one of the most exciting moments that I've had since doing this. Um, this really means the world to me. I hope it, you all got something from this. I hope you take this knowledge out and start activating on it so we can change the way our world operates. Without further ado, I bid you adieu. Have a good night, everyone. Steve from Real Progressives, Dr. Mitchell, so yeah. long.